Hello, and welcome to another episode of the SIRS Group Podcast. I'm Barbara. And I'm JC. And today we are continuing our SIRS X recap. SIRS X was a conference uh, with all of the amazing SIRS practitioners and IEPs and all kinds of fun stuff uh, in Boulder this year in July 2023. Lots of information there for you. Um, but we went and uh, so we're continuing our series on just recapping the amazing information that we absorbed from said conference. And today we are talking about protocol the healing yes. process. So these are all of the talks that were kind of surrounding the Shoemaker protocol and the various steps you need to do in order to heal. So we kind of lumped all of these talks together so we could talk about them in one recap episode. Before we jump in, we just want to give a quick reminder that Barbara and I are not medical professionals. We are SIRS patients. We run a community of people who are healing from SIRS. We went to SIRS X. We read the textbook. We have a lot of information about SIRS, but none, none of this should be taken as medical advice. The first talk is Dr. Dorninger. Dr. Dorninger, uh, his talk was screening for SIRS. And uh, I really liked the overall uh, main point of his talk was about there being a need for both screeners and screeners and treaters. The screeners, though, like as many people as possible should become screeners. If you deal with clients on any regular basis in any capacity, if you can identify the signs of SIRS and you know how to question the person about the potential for SIRS, and get them to answer uh, in uh, cross-examine people and question their exposure, question their symptoms, and get to the root of the problem and identify that the person in front of you has SIRS, you can then pass them along to all the resources, any practitioners, the Surviving Mold website. Uh, you can pass them along and help them get to treatment. Um, and a lot more people have it within their realm of abilities to become a screener. So I think that was like the big takeaway that I got from his talk. Yeah. And the really cool thing is we met a couple of people there who uh, one woman, she's going to chiropractor school. She's going to become a chiropractor and she was at SIRS X because she wants to incorporate it into her practice. And I was just like, oh, I love you. You're an amazing human. That's an incredible mission to have. Um, but one thing Dr. Dorninger did say was like with patients kind of speaking back to what you were saying about the cross-examination is like sometimes when you're looking at the symptom clusters, something like lightheadedness can be experienced in different ways. Like so, so for some people, they might identify that with like POTS or syncope or uh, more of like a vertigo type feeling. And it's just really... Uh, like you said, cross-examining, just questioning the definitions of those words. And same with exposure, like people who are like, oh, there was just a little mold in the bathroom, like patients will diminish that. Or um, he, he went on this rant about Airbnbs, calling themselves like cozy or rustic or charming. That was the other one he used. And it was just like, oh, those are like code words for may have mold. <laughs> like, <laughs> Are you even allowed to say that? I don't know. But the other really cool thing I thought um, I got from that talk was the VCS test, which is the visual contrast sensitivity test. It's uh, one of the ways that we can track treatment and track exposure because biotoxins have a direct impact on nerve function. So meaning your ability to distinguish blurred lines, but also the inflammation in the tiny capillaries in the back of your eye can make it difficult to see blurred lines. Um, so we use the VCS test to track treatment progress as well as exposure events. Um, and in the surviving mold realm and the shoemaker protocol realm, they kind of say like the pass fail rate is very binary. Like if you fail it, you definitely have SIRS. If you pass it, you don't have SIRS. But some practitioners did like in clinic studies and they found that to not be true. You can pass the VCS test and still have SIRS, but it's still a powerful tool because you'll still see improvement. It's like if you have a scale that is five pounds off, but it's always five pounds off, you can still see the trend over time. So it's still a very useful tool. I don't want people to think it's not, um, but just know that you may pass the VCS test and still have SIRS. Right. Yeah, I've definitely really leaned in since the talk, since going to SIRS X, I've leaned into using the VCS test as more of a, uh, like stepping on the scale. Like, I, I mean, I think I've taken the VCS test probably four or five times 
uh, in the last month, just because I, I did want to see, oh, I just went to the gym. Let me test to see if I got affected at all by that. And I'll compare again, just comparing my results from one to results from before. And, and in that sense, they can both be off, but they will chances are be off in the same way. So it's a reliable tool to measure, um, you know, whether or not you've been exposed. And I also like what you said about, um, you know, that how people may experience a symptom. Uh, one that hit me was because I never thought I experienced confusion. I didn't think that was one of my symptoms. However, I have very much walked into rooms, very often I should say, walked into rooms and forgot why I walked into them. That's confusion. Because most people might think of confusion as like um, old senile people or something like that. I was going to say politicians and I didn't want to go there. And now I went there anyway. Um, but, <laughs> um, uh, but confusion can simply just be forgetting why you like something that should have remained in your brain for more than a few seconds. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, it was a really great talk. I, I really appreciated um, all of the information that he brought forth. Oh, one important thing I don't want to forget. Um, he did say that headaches and fatigue are nearly universal across the board and all SERS patients. And if kids have either fatigue, headache, or abdominal pain, that is not normal for kids. You shouldn't just have chronic any of those three things. That's a really good sign that you should at least look into SERS as a possibility for them. And the good news about kids with SERS there's a silver lining there is that they uh they bounce back and recover so much faster than adults do so treatment they're just very responsive to treatment usually so that's um that's just a another note to to add to what he shared that day the next talk was the anti-inflammatory benefit of the carnivore diet by our very own judy cho um i will be honest i took terrible notes during this one because if, for anyone who doesn't have this context barbara and i came to SIRS through carnivore. So we, we were pretty bought in to this yes. talk from the start. Yeah. Not, I, I took zero notes. I very specific, I think, and I did this out of love. I put my pen down and I fully focused on Judy for her whole talk. I just like stared uh, and absorbed. So um, yeah, so I didn't take any notes on this one, but like you said, she was preaching to at least our choir. We were in the choir. Uh, and we believe, you know, in every all of her fantastic research that she's done on all of this. Um, really, I mean, the main the main thing that she was communicating to the group. And remember, this is a group of mostly not carnivore people, but she has very specialized experience in dealing with carnivores who have SIRS and she has seen them benefit from carnivore in that the treatment uh, is not as hard on them. They they get through it easier, or, you know, like as far as uh, side effects from medications and, and all that fun stuff. Um, she just sees carnivore being more supportive of SERS patients than even the uh, low amylose diet that most practitioners recommend. And I think an interesting point about that is that Craig Emmerich, uh, he's married to Maria Emmerich, he also has ankylosing spondylitis like I do. And he said in an interview that he did that he feels like he didn't pursue SIRS as the source of his ankylosing spondylitis for so long because carnivore was keeping him so well. So people who do have SIRS might be kind of masking their symptoms by eating the super anti-inflammatory diet. And I do have some notes about why it's anti-inflammatory for anyone who's not sold on carnivore. Um, but one of the things is, uh, you know, eating a high fat diet, you're not having the inflammation from a lot of glucose in your diet. Cholesterol is really good. It's a precursor for a lot of different hormones in your body. And then you're not eating the plant toxins. So plants can't run away, right? <laughs> they can't bite you. They can't run away like animals can. And so they develop chemical warfare is probably just a really extreme way to say it, but they have chemical deterrence to eating them. And so that manifests in a lot of different plant toxins. And for people who have SIRS, our toxin buckset, buck, buckets, buckets <laughs> are so full that anything we can do to reduce that toxic load is super helpful. And then one more thing I'll say, because I didn't know this, but um, she said statins risk 
like uh, risk giving people depression because it limits serotonin. And we know that dopamine and serotonin are so dysregulated in people who have SIRS. That's just another thing to be aware of if you do have SIRS and you're on a statin, um, that may be something you want to consider changing. Oh, my general takeaway for this talk, it was uh, carnivores bay. So. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and, and you don't have to go full carnivore. I just want to say that in case you needed that reassurance, like if, oh, well, I can't go full carnivore. I could never give up insert item here. Then do carnivore plus if that item. insert item is broccoli, we, like, can we just have a conversation? I just want to <laughs> know why it's broccoli. Why isn't it ice cream? Why is it farts? <laughs> it, a fair question. And I one that's a necessary question, I have to say. Yes, I agree. But whatever your insert item is here, is, um, I, I, you can do carnivore plus that item. Obviously, it would be great if it would continue to be low amylose, whatever that extra stuff was. Um, but, but going keto, ketovore, carnivore, heavily meat based, all of these things are great. Um, I do hear that there's a few vegans that go through SIRS protocol. This isn't the channel for for them, but um, but if you if you can include as many animal proteins and fats in your diet as possible, I think you will still uh, reap some of those benefits that the super strict people also get. Yeah, and we talk about this a lot in all areas of the protocols. People would be like, okay, but what's the perfect way to do this? Like, what is the the perfect step? And it's like, okay, there there's going to be like an ideal. And there's going to be like a not ideal where the not ideal is like catastrophic, right? But it's a scale. And so anything you can do to move that slider towards the more ideal is probably a good choice. But I'm going to recall a talk that we already recapped. Um, it was the one about Parkinson's disease um, that Lori Mishley did. And she said that the best, uh, the people who progressed best, meaning they didn't have an uh, uh, increase in Parkinson's system symptoms over time, were not the ones who were perfect. They were the people who lived in balance and moderation. And so it's it's not about achieving the ideal every day, so that if you don't achieve the ideal, you like flip over to the catastrophic. It's about getting as close to the ideal as you can. Yes. Good enough is good enough. And mm -hmm. you are good enough. We love you. Yeah. <laughs> the next talk that we're going to talk about, and it's kind of funny that this one follows the carnivore one, was the immunomodulatory effects of camel milk. And this was done by Dr. Jody DeShore, and she is a vegan, but she drinks camel milk. So even this vegan is saying like, hey, animal protein is probably pretty healthy for us. Right. Yeah, I was I was impressed by the fact that a vegan was happily focusing her talk on an animal product. Um, and I mean, she got into the like protocol. It's like a teaspoon this day and then a little bit more the next day. I mean, it, it actually reminded me a lot of the GAPS diet um, mm. just because uh, for anyone who doesn't know the GAPS diet, it's it has to do with like bone broth and fermented um, foods like sauerkraut, but like you only like take a little teaspoon of the sauerkraut juice one day and then like you wait and then you take another the second day. Like it's just very slow, very calculated. Um, if you are in a lot of pain or in her case, in uh, Dr. Jody DeShore's case, she was treating uh, children with autism spectrum disorder. Um, you know, that's those are situations where you measure out with the teaspoon, like you do the protocol, you do a strict little by little, you know, following directions of a practitioner, you're under practitioner's care. That's a, that is a, an extreme case where you do want to be careful and kind of perfect a little bit, like mm -hmm. as perfect as you can to kind of, I guess, juxtapose with what we just talked about, um, of being as good enough. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very specific protocol that it, she's developed that seems to positively impact children with autism and it, it, and children with autism spectrum disorder do tend to have 
autoimmune issues, GI issues, SIRS. And so there's a lot of crossover there for her, which is why she brought the talk to SIRS X, I imagine. The next talk was coagulation, SIRS, and Genie. And this was done by Dr. James Ryan. Um, he is a doctor in the PhD sense, not the MD sense. I'm saying that because he is actually the creator of the Genie. So the Genie is a genetic test. It allow, It's different from the haplotype test that we do to see which biotoxins we might be sensitive to. But the Genie will actually show you uh, which genes are being impacted by SIRS, and it can tell you a lot of really cool things. I know you recently had a conversation with your practitioner about it, so I'll let you recap that for everyone. Yeah, so the Genie is, uh, it, I didn't quite grasp how fantastic and how much like data that it gives you, how fantastic it, it is and how much data it gives you when you do it until my practitioner took me through. She actually was able to show me someone else's genie um, because genies actually um, automatically don't have any identifying, um, like doesn't have your name or anything on it so that it can be used uh, as part of the research for progressing on SIRS treatment in general by Dr. Richie Shoemaker. So um, she was able to show me someone else's and it shows you all of these different systems in the body and genes in the body and whether they are upregulated, downregulated or normal, or if a, a gene is turned on or off. Um, and that's that can also inform how to do the treatment, exactly like what step you might need to skip or you may need to spend more time on this particular step or, or what have you. The reason I am going to be doing the Genie is that I did not clear Marcons um, successfully or I may have, but I definitely got recolonized and VIP spray did not make any kind of impact on me, negative or positive. And there is... Um, some data that could come out of the genie test that would explain why that happened and could then inform how to move forward. So that is why I'll be taking the genie test. And when I do finally get my genie test results back, we will do a full episode. I will happily share my results um, and we'll go over what exactly it showed me and what that means for my treatment as well. So stay tuned for that. My big takeaway from the genie talk was, and this was a very, uh, scientific talk like he really like got into the details of the science behind the the genie it wasn't so much patient fo uh facing in the sense of like here's how the genie helps your patients it was more of like here's the really cool scientific stuff that the genie is built out of um so it's not as relevant i think to this conversation today but the one thing he said that i really appreciated was that the genie shows the details and then the neuroquant which is the mri brain scan that you can get um as part of your surge treatment which shows the we did an episode about this with dr christian navarro torres if you're interested in watching that one um but he talked about how the the neuroquant measures the volumetric changes in different brain structures from the chronic inflammation, how it actually shrinks. So Dr. Jimmy Ryan says that the genie shows the detail and then the neuroquant shows the big picture, which is the brain shrinkage. Um, so I did appreciate him kind of wrapping up his talk with like, here's what you should have taken away from it. Yes. I was like, thank you. Cause I, that was over my head. <laughs> yes. I appreciated it as well. And the next talk was Understanding Immune Response Genetics, and this was by Dr. Scott McMahon. So this talk was about HLA genetics, so the haplotypes that we get uh, get tested as part of the initials or his blood work to identify which biotoxins we might be sensitive to. And this was really interesting because when we talk about SIRS, it's the whole thing with chronic inflammatory response syndrome is that we are genetically predisposed to being really bad at eliminating a biotoxin. And then we encounter that biotoxin. So he was specifically talking about that interaction of like, this is how your genes should be able to identify and then eliminate this biotoxin. And this is how they're not doing that. So that's essentially what this talk was. It, he too got very much into the science of it. But basically, he was explaining how these haplotypes are the markers for not being able to eliminate those biotoxins. So when you get your initial SIRS blood work, part of it is the haplotypes, part of it is the innate immune response blood markers, and the haplotypes can help inform your treatment as well. You said that so beautifully. I am not going to muddy it up by adding anything. 
one thing he did say um, that, and I think Dr. Dorninger said this too, is that the reason we don't call SIRS biotoxin illness is because it's we're not responding to the biotoxins. It's not like it's the biotoxin actively attacking us. That's the problem. The problem is our immune response to the biotoxin. And the problem with calling it biotoxin illness is that it makes it sound like, oh, if I just kill the mold, I'll be fine. But that's not true because even if the mold is dead in your environment and it gets into your body, your body is still identifying a foreign body and doesn't know how to get rid of it. So it doesn't matter if the biotoxin is alive or dead. It just matters that biotoxin matter is inside of your body and your body cannot eliminate it and therefore creates this immune response that is catastrophic to your health. So when we talk about SIRS, we call it chronic inflammatory response syndrome for that reason. That is why we don't call it biotoxin illness. And I thought that was a really major takeaway for me personally in learning how to communicate about SIRS better with the people around me, the people in my life, because it's not like, oh, I'm allergic to mold or I'm sensitive to mold. It's that my body doesn't understand what mold is and it will attack me because it doesn't know how to get rid of the mold. The, the sentence that Dr. D said that I wrote down because it was so beautifully concise is that it is a disease of vehement, uncontrolled immunoreactivity. Like that is what it is. And I do, I will say that like to, to certain professionals who, who don't understand what SIRS is, I do still say, oh, I'm really sensitive to mold or, oh, I have an autoimmune illness around mold. I'll say something like that. That's still appropriate in those situations if you're testing their knowledge of SIRS. Um, but exactly like you said, I think that when we're explaining it to family, our supportive loved ones, people who need to understand exactly how it's affecting us, the way you described it is beautiful and perfect. The next talk was osteopathy as an adjunct therapy for those with SIRS. And this was by Dr. April Vakulik. Um, This was so interesting to me. I had not really had any experience of what osteopathy was before this talk like no zero awareness apparently the whole royal family uses it yes sign me up um the reason i say sign me up is because she showed before and afters and this is so shallow and vain of me but she showed before and afters the people who had gotten these osteopathy treatments and they literally looked prettier it was it was like weird like more symmetrical and we're talking like their nose was more symmetrical. Like, how does that even happen? What is she doing to them? I I would love to know. <laughs> I would it, love to know as well. I think importantly, you could see like inflammation left too. Like, I think sure. part of it was like inflammation. I don't know. Like, I know that the, she manipulates the face, but I also think some of the s- symmetry was gained by reducing inflammation. And when we talk about chronic inflammatory response syndrome, the whole problem is inflammation. So anything you can do to like help your body reduce the level of inflammation is super helpful. So it was really cool to see like just visually in one or two sessions, she would write, you know, how many sessions it had taken that these people looked better. Yeah. And it was, it was also like spinal. She had some profile shots and it was like their neck posture, their, their shoulders, their whole back. Um, you know, there were some older people that were more hunched and then they were not afterwards. And she not only had like an an after picture that was, you know, after the 15 minute session, which is all it took. But then she would also have a picture of like six months later or whatever. And it was like still there, like still improved. So, yeah, really, again, uh, I I also had no idea of it. I knew about osteopathy, but I didn't know really what the benefits could potentially be and seeing that and also seeing how much it's used in animals as well unfortunately mostly internationally and not here in the states um was also really fascinating to me um and 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 she did she took an extra moment in her talk to differentiate herself between between a do and a chiropractor um so i want to as well just to make sure that's clear. A chiropractor, you may be familiar with the fact that they'll like do something kind of quickly and like aggressively, or I don't know if that's the right word, but it's like a quick movement. It's very acute. It's an acute movement. Whereas her manipulations are just that they're more of like these gentle working with the body manipulations. Obviously she, she holds her work in higher regard than 
what a chiropractor would do um, and, and kind of actually talked a little bit about the dangers of chiropractic work as opposed to the work that she does. So she did make that distinction. And I, I just wanted to say it because I know it, it must be important to her as well. It, it is a pretty important difference. She brought a massage table to Sir's ex. And so like at various points throughout the conference, I saw her doing the manipulations. And before she did the talk, I was like, is she like doing massage on people? Like it looked like massage. That's how like gentle and flowing the movements were, like as compared to a uh, chiropractor where they're like popping and cracking and snapping. Right. It was like, I literally thought she was massaging people. And I was like, where do I sign up for this? can I go next? Um, yes. But it was it was really cool that I actually got to kind of see that happen. So if you're interested in finding a doctor of osteopathy, first of all, their designation is going to be DO rather than MD. And did you write down the website that she recommended? If not, we can put it in the show notes. Yeah, we'll put it in the show notes. I think I have it in my notes. Awesome. So we'll put it in the uh, show notes. Um, and then the one takeaway I had from this was that, and we say this a lot, but your body wants to heal. And sometimes it's just a matter of giving it what it needs in order to heal and then getting out of your own way. I think sometimes we overcomplicate things or we make it harder than it needs to be. But once you find this path to healing, you can really support yourself, do the shoemaker protocol, do the biohacks that make you feel as good as you possibly can feel during the treatment, and then just let the treatment work. Beautifully said. I have nothing more to add. Was that our, um, that was all the talks on the protocol, right? That was every single one of the talks on the protocol. <laughs> well, we hope that you guys enjoyed all of those uh, recaps uh, of the of the protocol. If there's any questions that you have, or if you want us to do a deeper dive on any of these topics, just leave us a comment below. Um, otherwise, for more resources, support, and all that other fun stuff, uh, join us over at thesirsgroup.com. We have a good time over there. You should do that. Otherwise, I guess we will see you next time. See you then.